to see some familiar faces and some other faces that I look forward to, to meeting and getting to know. And uh, we have definitely enjoyed living here in the area for a little bit over five years now. Time flies. And uh, we, we live in Port Orange just up the road, my wife and my daughter. And uh, so it's, it's really nice to, to be able to come down here and worship with you today. I've been over here a few other times before, but this is my first time here on a Sabbath morning with you all. So uh, again, thanks for, for inviting me, and, uh, and it's great to, to be a part of uh, this family now officially uh, working with Ricky. And, uh, and so uh, how many of you like being forced to do things you don't want to do? <laughs> I got a surprise. One person raised their hand. <laughs> um, I, I noticed my daughter didn't raise her hand. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's true. I mean, we, we don't like being forced to do things we don't want to do. Um, and, and, and so, depending on your point of view, uh, resistance to laws that you don't agree with, right, uh, can get you one of two labels. You can either be labeled as a reformer if the law is unjust, right? But if the law is just, then you would be called a rebel, right? Yeah. So it's, it's depending on your point of view uh, and the point of view of others, what happens or how you're viewed when you resist doing uh, something that you don't want to do. And of course, the, the way that we discern whether a law is just and good or whether it's unjust is we have to know the truth, right? Because if we don't know the truth, then there's no way to discern what is right or wrong, and then it just becomes a matter of opinion. And when we have matters of opinion, of course, uh, we know that those are never-ending arguments, right? Because there really can be no solution to them. Uh, there's no standard of truth. And that's the world we live in today. We live in this relativistic society. And, and once truth becomes uh, relative, then everyone's point of view is equal and needs to be heard. And therefore, there can be no true uh, conclusion to some of these matters that we tend to argue about. Of course, it's most obvious um, in the political world. But um, much deeper than that, is the spiritual world. And I think as Seventh-day Adventists, particularly, we have a very complex and deep understanding of this battle, which is called the Great Controversy, right? And, and, and so this, this is the overarching argument uh, that the whole universe is involved in. Uh, and, and, and we on Earth are really the only ones that are still kind of questioning what side to be on because the world, I mean the universe, has already clearly seen the character of Satan when he put Jesus on the cross to death and that matter was settled in the universe. Uh, right then and there, who was right and who was wrong in the great controversy, but here on earth, that was just the beginning, right? That was the beginning of the church, that ever since has been the goal of the church, the, the, the true uh, witness of the church is to go into all the world and preach the everlasting gospel, and that gospel is about defining what is true about God and about us. And as we understand our position with Him and His uh, character, then it's up to us to choose. We get to choose who we're going to believe. But we can't choose accurately if we don't know what the truth is. And so, in the meantime, we struggle, we battle, we fight, and, and we resist. Uh, I can remember I was what you would call a rebel as a, uh, as a teen, for sure, early young adult. Um, I, I, uh, even though I have to say some of the laws that I had, that I rebelled against, I still kind of question how just they were. One of them in particular, I can remember, if you were in academy, if you're, if you're Seventh-day Adventist and you grew up and you went to boarding academy, you can relate 
to what I'm about to share. So back in the 90s when I was in, in, the, in the academy, uh, there was something called CDs, right? Kids, you've probably, probably never seen one before. Uh, but that was how we listened to music in the 90s. And, uh, and so it was, it was illegal to have CDs or CD players in the dorm where I attended at Great Lakes Avenue Academy. And I thought that was the most unjust rule in the world. Um, and so you can imagine, since I thought it was unjust, Naturally, I rebelled against it, and I every year I would sneak my CD player, I'd sneak my CDs, and almost every year I got caught because they ended up doing a raid at some point during the year, and out came the contraband, and we were all just had to hang our heads in shame as the dean pulled all the stuff out, and then we all got fined and had to to, to pay the price for for breaking the rule, and. Uh, and, and so we ended up being, a lot of times, forced to do things we didn't want to do when we broke the rules in academy. Uh, one of the most severe rules that I ever uh, broke was going AWOL, uh, which is when you go off campus without permission, and then you get caught. So that, I made that foolish choice one time, and only one time, because the penalty was $25 fine, 20 hours of free labor, and it was the free labor that really was the challenge for me because it was Michigan in the middle of winter and they had me doing grounds duty and I was picking ice off the sidewalk for most of that 20 hour um, <laughs> free labor. And, uh, and, and so th this is the, the, the result of, of, of breaking the rule, right? And, and so that's what happened. I was forced to do what I didn't want to do. And, uh, and so when we're forced to do things we don't want to do, there's different, again, there's different ways to label that. It could be, number one, a punishment or discipline. That, that's a positive way of looking at, at uh, but it can also be, if it's unjust, right, it can be uh, abuse. It can be slavery, right? When, when someone unjustly is forced to do what they don't want to do, right? And, um, and, and so this is interesting when it comes to, to force, right? Because we can force people to do things up to a certain point, right? But can we force someone to believe something against their will? Interesting. You've probably heard the term, a man convinced against his will is of the what? Same opinion still, right? So, so you can't force somebody to change how they believe. And even more than that, you cannot force somebody to love, right? You can't. Uh, and uh, you, the Beatles, you know, they told us you can't even buy love, right? You can't force it. You can't buy it. It's something that has to be given. So why is that the case? We're going to explore that today in a sermon I've entitled, Love Requires Freedom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity today to dig into the Word of God, and we pray that your Spirit will lead and guide into a deeper understanding of this topic of religious liberty. And uh, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, if you want to turn with me there in your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at verses 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says here, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So, right here we see in the beginning, we are told clearly that humanity, you and me, we were created in the image of God, right? 
And, uh, you know, there's a lot. You can go into that. We don't have time this morning. Uh, but clearly, we were created in the image both in form and in character. Um, and uh, I want to focus on the character side of that this morning. So, we know that if we were created in the image of God, in the image of His character, the Bible clearly defines the character of God, right? Right? 1 John 4, 6 says, God is what? Love. Love, love right? So, so, that means that we were formed in the image of love. We were created to love, we were created by love, and we were created for love. So, so this, this is the, the, the beautiful picture that we find in the Bible. Now some say, oh love, that's a very, uh, you know, how, how do you define love? And another great question we could spend a lot of time on. Uh, but for sake of time, I think the Bible gives us that clear uh, definition uh, succinctly in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So, let's go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, we'll pick it up in verse 8, or excuse me, verse 4. And it says here, verse, starting verse 4, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Oh. So, now we're starting to get somewhere with this, this definition of love. Um, and, and right away, by reading that, and a lot of times you read this at, at, at weddings, right? At least I typically do as a, as a preacher. You've probably heard it uh, spoken there a lot. Why? Because at a wedding, a husband and a wife are making a life long commitment to one another to love one another, right? And, and, and so we, we understand that love is other-centered oneness. That's what it is. It, and so it, that's, the, that's what marriage actually represents. It represents two individuals becoming one flesh. And the only way that's possible is through love. The, the one has to love the other more than they love themselves. There has to be this outward looking instead of an inward focus. And so this is how we were created. This is the nature that we were going to have, not just toward our husband and wife, but all humanity was to have this love for one another. Beautiful thing. And so, so this is interesting when we look, though, at, at, at how God gave us love, right? Because he didn't program it in us like you would a robot. We weren't programmed to love because if we were programmed to love, then it wouldn't be love anymore. The reason that marriage is so beautiful is that those two people are making a what? A choice, a commitment to one another. They're not being forced, at least hopefully not, to, to be married. They are choosing by their own free will to, to make that commitment. That's what makes it special. If you were forced to marry someone or someone was forced to marry you, it would not feel the same. It would not feel as genuine. You, you wouldn't um, really see it as love. It would be more like an obligation. It would be more like a, a tradition, but it wouldn't be love. And so in order for love to exist, it has to be chosen. And in order for love to be chosen, there has to be freedom. So love requires freedom. That's the basis for love. So if Adam and Eve were to be made in the image of God, they had to have the freedom to love him back in the same way that God loved them when he created them. If they didn't have the freedom to love him back, then they didn't have the free, they didn't have the ability to love. Yeah. And so God gave them a choice. 
We can read about it going back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 now. And uh, let's pick it up in verse 9. And then we're going to look at also verse 16 and 17. It says here, And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So right away we see the Bible tells us that the tree of life is contrasted with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and the tree of life speaks for itself. When we're eating from the tree of life, what do we get? Life, right? It's a choice. We can choose life every day when we're in the garden. Every day we go and we eat from the tree of life and we get life. And, and, and it's, a, it's, an, it's a choice. It's a beautiful thing. But there's also another option presented here. There is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, what did that choice entail? We can read about it in verse 16 and 17 now. It says here, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Out of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day of that you eat it, you will what? Surely. You surely die. Okay. So, so now... Um, now we see clearly the choice that is laid out in front of Adam and Eve. Now let me ask you this. Is God taking a risk in giving them the opportunity to choose? Yes. Yes. Yeah, he's taking a risk. Um, so, love is always a risk. Always is. When we choose to love... We are risking the potential of being rejected by that person that we choose to love. Um, and, and so much of the heartache in the world today is a result of us choosing to love and not being loved back in return. And, and the scars and the hurt and the pain that come as a result of that make us afraid to love. And then so we retreat into the opposite of love, which is self-centered independence, right? So, so love is other-centered oneness. The opposite of love is self-centered independence. And so that was the lie. That was the lie the devil said would bring us happiness. He said, look, God is just trying to control you. He, he, he's hiding from you the true meaning of life. If you just partake of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will experience self-centered independence from God and you will be happy. You will be free. But that was a lie. Right? It was a lie. It is a lie. Because we cannot be happy independent from God. We can't even be happy independent from each other. What's going on in the world today? Coronavirus, COVID-19, what has it done? It's isolated and isolated society even more. And so anxiety, depression, suicide is on the, the rise because we were made to live in community. We were made to live in other-centered oneness with each other. And now we have been, to a large degree, separated from that experience that was already not too good before. And now we're just in our little digital caves, and, and we're living in these digital caves, and it's not good enough. It, it doesn't truly meet the need. And if you take God out of that picture, forget about it, right? Forget about it. And so this was the lie. Now... What happened after Adam and Eve sinned? Right? I guess that's a loaded question. A lot of things happen, right? I want to let's look at a certain. Let's look at something in particular that happened. I want to. I want to know. Let's go to chapter three now. Genesis chapter three. 
And uh, let's, let's focus on verse 8 through 10. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. And, and so this is after they sin. It says here, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God, God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. All right. So, so who changed in this scenario? We did, right? We changed. God, remember, what's his nature? Love, other centered oneness. What's he doing? He's coming down to the garden. He's coming toward Adam and Eve because God is always moving toward us. He's never moving away from us. Amen? Amen. God is always moving toward us. Always. And that's something that we sometimes have a hard time believing. We're the ones who are running from God. We're the ones hiding from God. God is always looking for you and for me. And, and, and so he's moving toward them, and they're running away from him. And so this, friends, is the beginning. This becomes the focal point of the great controversy, right? Why, because why is God moving toward us? This is the question. Is he moving toward us to hurt us? Or is he moving toward us to help us? To help us, right? But sin has so warped our minds, this self-centered independence that we inherited as this new nature, warps our mind into thinking, when God is moving toward me, he's coming to control me. He's coming to hurt me. He's coming to take away my freedom. And so what do we do? We run. We hide. And this is the, the lie. This is what we came to believe. This is the essence of the great controversy. When God is coming toward us, what is he coming to do? Most of the world believes he's coming not to help us. And our job is to tell the truth. And so, so that they can see that he's not coming to hurt, he's coming to help. And so... We look through history, right? Time and time again, we see the same story repeated. God coming to help. His actions are misinterpreted. He's rejected. He's pushed away. Time and time and time again. God sends patriarchs. God sends prophets. God sends even some kings. And still, time and time again, the same thing takes place. Until we get to the New Testament. And we find one of our favorite passages in John chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. Where we see that God goes out of his way to show us who he is. And of course you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son in the world to do what? Amen. To condemn it, but that the world through Him might be what? Saved. Saved. So again, even there, God's making the point. Jesus did not come to condemn. He did not come all the way down here to get this close to us just to point us to hell. No. He came down here to point us to hell. Right? He came down to show how much God loves and how he never stops moving toward us. Um, and, uh, and he also came down to show that the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of heaven doesn't work by force. It works by choice. Amen. Right? That's God's kingdom. He does not force allegiance. He asks for allegiance. We choose to serve God because we want to, not because we have to. And His kingdom is a kingdom of love. It's 
his, the creation and the creator in a covenant relationship just like marriage, just like a man and a woman get up front and say they are going to pledge themselves to each other for the rest of their lives till death do us part. This is the relationship God has with his creation. It's a mutual, loving, interactive, other-centered oneness with each other. But what did sin do? Sin made us slaves, right? Sin was actually the thing that forced us, right? Forced us to, to become slaves of fear, slaves of pride, slaves of lust, slaves of hate. But the Bible says that Jesus came to set us free from all that. And so that is what we find is the New Testament is pointing to as far as the solution to the freedom that was lost in Eden is restored once again through the cross of Jesus Christ. And because of that, then the freedom that we had in Eden is once again restored. That's a beautiful thing. What happened in Eden? They had a choice every day to wake up and choose what? Choose life, right? They could choose death, but God said, choose life. Choose relationship with me. And we see the same thing uh, from our scripture reading, and this, this will be our closing text. Notice uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. And, and notice the language here. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Therefore, what? Choose life that, you, that both you and your descendants may live. That you may, what? Love. Love the Lord your God. That you may obey His voice. That you may cling to Him. For He is your life Amen. and length of your days. That you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. You see, this land that has been sworn, yes, it was physically a land in Canaan, but it, spiritually it stood for the new heavens and the new earth, right? It really stood for the garden restored, where we are once again in the presence of God, eating from the tree of life. Amen. Amen. That's what we look forward to. Amen. That's what Revelation points to. That is what is promised to the 144,000 who overcome. It says they...